Hi, I'm Ralph Preston. It's Tuesday morning at 11 a.m., our usual time to do our Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. And today we have uh, Dr. Julie Schwartfeger back. You loved her so much the first time, we brought her back a couple more times. And today we're going to, uh, she's going to do a little presentation, but I want everybody to realize it's also like a discussion. So if you have anything that you want to, um, talk about just you know feel free to uh, bring it up i know uh, julie likes interactivity so um let's see if we can make this interactive so um i thought about starting off with like kind of my definition of what wellness is but i decided to throw you a curveball and ask you what um if you'd give us like kind of your definition of um what uh what constitutes wellness well, all right. So the first Tuesday of the new year, uh, you, you throw me a curve and thank you for that. Um, I, will, I will try to do my best with that, but wellness I think is a really complex uh, construct, right? Um, something like uh, physical strength, you can measure your hand grip or something like that. When you talk about wellness, I think it can have a lot of different components to it. And what might be wellness for one person might not be for another, right? I think it's very personal as well. But certainly, it is far more than the absence of disease or injury. So I think that's a really important thing that would be true across people is, um, oh, you're not sick. Oh, you don't have a diagnosed disease or impairment. That's not enough to be wellness. Um, the absence of that is, is a beginning, but it's not wellness. And as Ralph so nicely put in, you know, things like, like breathing and yoga and how you're feeling and your thoughts and the joy that you get in a day, um, and your nutrition, all of these things certainly play a part in, in wellness. Um, but I also like, uh, Ralph, thank you so much for that curveball because what it also is, is a beautiful segue into something that I'm really grateful and very excited about being here at the Captain Level VA because they have a, a holistic health program that is really progressive. Um, and I say that having been like more decades than I care to admit actually in, in healthcare in the civilian sector. And I came here and was like, wow, this is just so progressive and so advanced. Um, the, the embrace of complementary and integrative medicine, which I think gets at wellness and not just um, curing sickness or curing, uh, you know, keeping people alive, right? Which our health system was built for. Um, this kind of brings it to the next level. And so what I wanted to share today, if, if it sounds like a good topic, and it fits what everyone wants to talk about today is the Veteran Whole Health Program. Um, specifically, I'll pull up a couple of the different documents and share them with you all, because uh, I find them really useful and I like to share good stuff with good people. So um, if, if it's okay, Ralph, do, do we wanna open up to the group and get some feedback if anyone has some ideas or things you'd like to talk about today? Um, Sure. Anybody have anything that really like to to um, <clears throat> hear covered today, or should we just let her go into her presentation? I would say let her speak because she's very knowledgeable. Okay, so that's one vote for you. Just go ahead, Julie. I guess. So. <clears throat> okay. Well, I will err on that side, and while I'm loading this, because it'll take me a second. I wanted to, uh, oh, now that's up twice, isn't it? I wanted to just uh, mention again, we are still recruiting for the mindful meditation study. Um, and so some of you might've reached out to me already um, and, and I'll be connecting back with you, but um, if, if you are interested, it's uh, online, it's, uh, uh, I can give you more information. And so um, please reach out. It, um, in your last 
presentation, I, I put it underneath the video in the description. And I'll do it again, and I can do it on the post when we post this video. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. Last time it was your, um, it was a short blurb, and it had your um, email and phone number. So just let me know if it's any different. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so what do you guys see? Do you see whole health? It starts with me. Yes. Okay. So email. Email. So this is a, you're seeing a view of a document that we have to give to veterans and it's freely available without any um, special password. Um, and it's just a lovely document that has a lot of research that's gone into it. It's used across all of the VAs uh, across the, the nation, which is kind of cool. Um, because it's so ubiquitous and far reaching, a, a lot of veterans don't don't even realize that they have access to this, which is one of the problems that I, I'm always mystified and really intrigued by when there's something really good out there that um, if it's not being pushed in one specific area, it can get lost um, as well. So this is called Whole Health. We're, we're, we're seeing a, an email, not the VA. Oh, no. okay. So that's not good. Let me fix this. You must have multiple monitors. I do. That's that's what I was worried about. This is a, an email about a overdraft clinic. <laughs> yeah, that's not what we want. Let's see. All right, let me share. I thought I moved things to the right. Let's see. Please stand by. We are now experiencing. Mm -hmm. No, I, I can edit this out too. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. Okay, so this one I was able to pull up faster. I'll do this one. So this is one of the specific um, downloadable uh, handouts for from the Whole Health program. So Whole Health is, uh, just to give you the background, instead of treating a person's diagnosis or what's, what they come to the clinic for that's wrong, this is treating the person and what matters to them and everything then flows from that. What's meaningful to me? What are the things that I have in my life that are important that I would like to do more of, uh, would like to re-engage in? Check my hand all of a sudden. It's just... Oh, it's the thumb, see? I, th I hear somebody talking. I don't want to miss you. Yeah, I can. No? Okay. Um, and so with that, this circle is the, the icon that they use. And so let me see if I can make this a little bit more centered. So this, this particular one is create a gratitude practice, but this cir circle is really the key for all of the um, whole health program. And so what you see is me, you're in the center, right? Or we are in the center. And then there's that mindful awareness, which is just really being in that moment versus thinking about or worrying about everything else and missing all of the sensory input of the moment that you're in, um, which I know I'm guilty of and I'm trying to do better with. And then around there is all of the wonderful possibilities around you to engage and to uh, access ways to have a healthier and a, a more wellness in your life. One is through moving your body, through uh, your energy and your flexibility. Another is through what they call power of the mind, and that's relaxing and healing. The next is spirit and soul, which is growing and connecting. And then there's also family, friends, and coworkers, and that's your relationships. Uh, the, down at the bottom of the circle here, you see recharge. That's your sleep and your uh, feeling refreshed, doing things that refresh you. Then it, there's food and drink, and that's nourishing and fueling. And then personal development, which is personal life and work life. It's that work life balance, right? And then our surroundings. So both the physical and the emotional surroundings that we find ourselves in or that we choose. Um, and down here, you see it's laid out a little bit, 
uh, slightly different. So there's you, there's your self-care, there's your professional care, the people you reach out to to get care from your, your physicians and your therapists and things like that. Then there's your community. And all of this together encompasses whole health. And so these little circles here, you see the green, the blue, the dark blue, the light blue. And that's the big bubble, if you will, that we have around us when we think about our health. So to go back to Ralph's well-placed um, question, when you think about wellness, um, all of these things are really key and really pivotal. And you can see where that's a lot of bubbles. So what's how I was raised, the things that I focus on, the things that are really important to me, the people that are important to me are gonna be different than, than all of those things are for each of you, which is wonderful and diverse, but it's also really complex. And so that's where tailoring things to the individual of starting with what matters to me is really important. So with that, if does anyone have any questions on this before we move on? I, I have one who can ask it now or, or later, and that, and that is, um, you mentioned that these are available for download. I'm sure if you're a, a, a vet, they're available for download on the VA website that you have access to. Is there any place where um, stroke survivors could um, download them? Yeah, well, one thing is I, I, I've already shared some of these with, with Ralph. Um, but I can send these along with the, with the list. <clears throat> and I'll also look for a link that I can send out. Uh, yeah, you sent them to me and I can email them to other people. But um, if there's links, then I can post the link somewhere. Like, you know, when I post the this um, talk and then people can go download them themselves without having to email me and me having to forward them to them. Just a thought. Yeah, no, that's a great thought. And <clears throat> what I should have done, you're making me go, hmm, if I, what else could I have done to prepare? I should have made sure I was not on my VA inter intranet and uh, found a link to make sure that when I say these are publicly available, I'm not thinking that because I'm on the VA server. Um, but I will do that as soon as we finish here. I'll look for the external link that will hopefully give you an access to all of this material. <clears throat> With well, that, I, if, if they're not available or it becomes difficult, I can put them somewhere where they could be. Like a zip folder, yeah. And I will say this, there is an enormous amount of material, which is one of those things that's, I always think about ordering coffee at Starbucks. Uh, there's so many choices, it's overwhelming sometimes. So there really is a rich, huge number of brochures to download. Um, so it can be a little bit overwhelming, but they are all sectioned off by these, these headings, right? So the personal development, the surroundings, moving the body, power of the mind, spirit and soul. But then from there, there's all of the different things that they offer within one of these sections. And there's videos. So there's videos for meditation, for breathing. Um, but I will get some of those and, and make sure that I, I give you the access link. So yes, thank you. Well, I mean, Anybody else have that they're only available to uh, veterans. It's actually interesting to me that the VA is um, taking this kind of forward approach on wellness. It's not something that we're used to seeing from the medical community or insurance companies or, or anybody, you know, for a long time, we've been wondering why they don't take a more holistic, uh, more proactive type of a, uh, approach so i think it's a good good thing to to see this and i, I have a dropbox so if worse comes to worse we can put whatever uh is available into my dropbox and make a, a link available to people so they can just download it wonderful and and as we're talking look right below where where i had it scanned to uh is https colon double forward slash www.va.gov forward slash whole health forward slash, um, which does not look to be a secure site. So I, I think that is where you'll have an access portal to all of these. But I do warn you, <clears throat> there's a lot. So if you feel overwhelmed, know that I, I too, when I go in there, have to go like, okay, what is it I'm looking for? And I'll pick one thing at a time. 
Well, so, um, that do be to find the specific links and label them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. You know, in my posts, in other words, say, okay, here's the thing to this, and here's the link, and you know, just to avoid that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, again, whole health is an approach to healthcare empowering the individual, each of us, right, in our own health. And it's giving us that power to take charge of our health, to know that we are the driver and um, our well-being. And I love to hear what they use the term well-being. That's what we started this conversation with. And to live our lives to the fullest, which is a big part of what well-being is, right? What, what's the best that I have in my day? And how do I achieve that? Um, that's, that's part of wellness. And it's, again, the fact that it starts and ends with, with ourselves is an empowering uh, thought. And it's fueled by knowing yourself and what really works for you in your life, right? No one else can know that and tell you. And once you have some ideas about this, if you share those with a healthcare team that is receptive to that and wants to um, make sure that you're empowered and driving your healthcare, then they can better support you and better uh, align what, what care and how they deliver that care to reach your goals. So again, here's the, re the, the main resource portal. I will be sending out some more kind of thin sliced things um, to, to give little captioned areas or sectioned off areas of those bubbles. And the one I chose for today, um, coming out of the holidays, coming out of all of the joy and the stress and the fatigue that the holidays I know meets for me, um, and maybe you as well, is choosing, the, so this goes with power of the mind. Choosing a gratitude practice is not so important just for you know, being kind to other people, but what it turns out is that there's a lot of research that shows that it improves our own health. And so giving the time and um, making time to develop healthy and positive thoughts changes the, the um, hormones and the things that our, our brain and our body release. And it actually makes those good chemicals come out where it boosts our immune system, and helps us with our own resilience and helps us be healthier and feel better, which is kind of nice. So um, when people say, you, you know, be grateful, have gratitude, a lot of times it's growing up, it, for me, it was always something you were taught to do to be, a, you know, a good, a good person. This is a little different take on it. And I think it's important to say, this is about choosing a gratitude practice because it's good for us. Um, it's healthy and it's healing for ourselves. Um, and so that was a little different for me. So I, I don't know, maybe you guys are like, yes, of course we know that. So this first uh, part just talks about why is being grateful important for your health. And again, uh, there's some, you see the little um, citations. So there's some research that they quote in here. Um, but physically, gratitude can improve your energy level and it also can help you sleep better. And if you've ever been stressed or upset with something and you go to bed unhappy, um, maybe you can attest, I know I can, I, my sleep is not as good. I don't wake as rested. Sometimes I'm tossing and turning and I have these thoughts that are racing through my head. If I can find a way to be grateful and have that be the thought I go to bed with, I, I'm much more relaxed and I get more healthy sleep. And so it helps my energy level and good sleep, which is so important for health. Also, um, mood, depression, anxiety, and the use of different substances that might help us cope sometimes, but might not be the best for us and make us feel good in the long run. Um, having a gratitude practice can also help lower the amount of that that you might want to do or, or feel compelled to do. And also, uh, it helps you feel better about your body. So it's kind of funny to think just having a practice of being grateful for things in your life. Um, helps with your body, um, uh, your view of your own body, which is kind of cool. Also, it helps you with happiness, pride, and hope, which I bundle together and call resilience. And then it also helps your feeling of connectedness with others. And because human beings, we, we are social creatures, right? It's just how it's in our DNA. So having that gratitude practice, if you are feeling isolated, and COVID certainly did that for me, 
um, the gratitude practice is a way to hone those connections even when physically you're not able to engage and, and get to hang out with people physically uh, and be in the same space with them. And all of this is free, so that's a little punch here. So what is a gratitude practice? Now that we talked about the fact that it's worth checking out, gratitude practice is having a routine and it starts with um, identifying things that have meaning to you. And though it can be things that frustrate you. It can be times that you feel overwhelmed. Um, it can be things that you reflect on your day and, and they stand out. These are little memory traces or short-term memories in your day of like, I'm remembering that, I'm remembering that. If it got to the level of your awareness that you remember it, it means it was important to you on some level. Um, all of those are great starting points for saying this might be an area. I might want to see if I can pick something and try out this gratitude practice stuff. And so they give some examples here. Um, there's different gratitude practices. You can, it be, can be as simple as dedicating time each day just to reflect on something you're grateful for in your life. Maybe you say, when I drink my coffee, I'm going to give myself the gift of that one minute when I take that first sip of coffee and then take a nice deep breath and think about a blessing in my life, something I'm grateful for. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's um, the, the, the house that I'm sitting in or the space that I'm sitting in. Maybe it's the cup of coffee itself and how much it tastes so delicious and helps me be awake. <laughs> Just embracing that moment. Um, it also could be thinking about the day before and something that happened. And then another thing that they mentioned here specifically is being showing gratitude to yourself, which I think is, is can be the hardest thing to do of all. And so if you thank your body, right? So often, what do we do to our body? We get mad at it. Um, I, I had a, I have a, an aunt who's very funny in the way she'll say stuff and she was having back pain and she was talking to me and I, you know, I'm a physical therapist by background. So I'd give her advice and then it would come back to haunt me. She'd say, oh yeah, I, I told you I had neck pain. She told me to hang myself because I gave her a little traction thing. <laughs> but one time she was having back pain and I said, so how is your back? And she said, oh, it's fine. I don't talk to it and it doesn't talk to me. But when she said that as funny as that is as a statement, it's a great example of how when your body doesn't do just what you want and expect it to do, you blame it, right? You get mad at it. And in, in her case, she divorced her back, right? So they're fine. They just were going to go their separate ways. In your brain, the fact that you're, you're whole, you're one whole, there's, there's actually some damaging aspects of that. And we all do it. I know I, I will admit to, I do it all the time. Um, and even your self-talk, if you don't do something quick enough, if you stumble on your toe, you're like, oh, stupid, you know, you blame your foot, you blame yourself. Um, I don't know why, but I, I know I was raised that that's just kind of a typical thing we do. If instead, you can be grateful, be like, so okay, tripped over my toe. Thank goodness, I'm able to get up and be walking to trip over that toe. And my body was able to catch me where I didn't fall, right? So like, if you can turn that thought around and see the, 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 the positive aspects of what's going on versus pushing to see what more you could have done or what you'd like to be able to do. Um, these are those healing thoughts. And again, I think the hardest ones are to have the gratitude thoughts for yourself and your body. Um, and so this is a little bit more about combat compassion practice, and you see another click here that we can link to. Um, but I'm going to go right to the, because this is an introduction, and so far I don't feel like anyone's getting bored, I'm going to carry on. But you guys interrupt whenever and however you want. This is supposed to be a, a, a fun group thing to do. Uh, okay, so how do we start our gratitude practice? So there's the, the nice thing is you're not going to get scored on this and not get an A. The fact that you're even thinking about it, we all get an A. Um, there's not a wrong way to do this. And different practices work for different people. This is that beautiful diversity and individuality. We all are going to have something that works different for us. And it might vary from time in the day and uh, days and weeks. It, it might change what works for us. 
Some people like setting reminders. If you're very organized, you might have a little timer uh, or you might do like I suggested at the beginning. I'm, I'm very girly this way. I like I, I navigate by landmarks. And if I have things in the day that aren't right on my calendar that I have to follow, I usually like to do stuff like, oh, when I get stopped at one of those irritatingly long stoplights when I'm driving, what a wonderful time to take that and turn it into doing a gratitude exercise. Or what a great time to do an, um, uh, uh, an isometric exercise or some breathing exercises. Now I took something that was an irritation where I'd be like, oh, this is making me late. You know, this light is so long and uh, I get this light all the time. It's so irritating. Instead, I turn that around and say, wow, what a great opportunity. I probably would have forgotten to do my breathing exercises. Now I have like three whole minutes. Um, where there's nothing else I can think about. I just have to wait for this light. I'll do one here. So whatever that is, um, a, a, a clock reminder, the drinking your coffee, uh, when you get home from a certain thing that you do every day, um, uh, sunsets, you know, whatever those things are can be the checkpoint. And if you really like doing it, you might find that there's times throughout the day that you would pick. Um, so uh, instead of saying grace or after grace at the beginning of a meal um, is, is another suggestion. Now, other people who are more creative and like to have um, physical manifestations of things that they're thinking about um, and have the energy and the talent for this might also do other fun things to do a gratitude practice. And those might include things like a gratitude jar or container, right? So you take a jar and people, I've seen people decorate these and everything. And um, you write your blessings down when you're thinking that and you put it in the jar. So you fill up the jar. You could have fun and make different colors of paper and things like that. And, um, and then in your bedtime routine, sometimes people find journaling helpful. Oh, there's a question. Yes, Polly. And maybe not as much a question as a suggestion. Yeah. I think, and last year I did a joy jar, similar to a gratitude jar. Um, and I saw a suggestion for one just last week that just a good things jar. And what I liked about the one last week is that sometimes saying, write down everything that happened during the day can be re really overwhelming. For this one, for the good things jar, it was once a week, write down something good that happened. And so you're just doing one one time a week, but at the end of the year, you'll have 50 things to look back over. And that might be more approachable for someone, especially someone like me, who my more affected side is my dominant side. So I'm writing with my non-dominant hand and don't have a lot of functional use to open a jar, hold a piece of paper, that kind of thing. And then the same thing with the, the bedtime gratitude journal. I had a nurse at stroke camp suggest doing a bedtime gratitude journal, but she said one thing. So if you just start with one thing that you write down and it may be a single word, but just to be approachable that it doesn't have to be write down at least three things that, and, you know, I think that's important to remember with a group that may have some physical disabilities that make it harder to complete physical tasks. I love that Polly. Well said. And I, I like that you brought uh, the, the, statement of a joy jar, which in my mind is the same thing, right? Um, what, what are you grateful for? What brings you joy? Um, and and maybe, they, maybe somebody else would separate them out, but I feel like it fits the same way. And I love that. Yeah, it's not about how many words are written down and it could even be a smiley face. You know, I mean, I, I think it's just an expression that you're manifesting in a physical way um, but I know other people who don't like writing stuff down. They find that to not be their thing, right? And if, if it takes a long time and it's a lot of thought to put into it, that's not relaxing before bed, um, 
it makes me think of like, well, what are other ways to express that? That might be just if just as good, if not better, um, for for you personally. And uh, it makes me think of a movie. I'm a movie person, so you guys can holler at me if you're like, stop with the movie references. But do you guys know an old movie called A Room with a View? Has anyone heard of this one? Yeah. It's pretty pretty well known, yeah. Do you remember there's a funny fella in this movie and um, they go off to this beautiful place in Italy. They take a little cart off to this little farm area. And there's this fella who's a little odd, the son of one of the people on the trip. And he's out on one of these low trees yelling, truth, beauty. And, and they're like, what is with him? What's with this guy? And it's his, it, it, and I think the father who's played by Denham Elliott, who's brilliant. He says, oh, he's saying his creed. And it's his expressing his feelings of, of joy or gratitude with the world and with, with life, right? And so they're very generic, you know, truth, beauty, like these are huge concepts. This isn't, um, you know, I, uh, my coffee tasted really good this morning and I was so grateful to be warm in my home on a cold night last night. Um, but it gets at the same thing, right? It's just feeling that joy, having those thoughts. And he didn't write down anything. Of course, he did climb a tree. Um, but I mean, the, 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 the point is, your own expression of it should work for you too. Some other people like to record stuff and play it back, right? So you might have a recorder that you use for journaling. Um, to, to Polly's good point, there's no wrong way to do this. Um, yeah, there you go. And it really is that it works for you. Um, Julie, so I have something funny talking about. This morning is the first time in, I can't remember when, that I didn't get the traffic light at the FedEx office. <laughs> and, and I was grateful not to get the traffic light this morning. There you go. And then for you, Ralph, when I got to PT at seven this morning, the sun was coming up and the sky was just beautiful. So I stopped and took some photos. Um, you know, I think it's always important to notice the uh, beauty around us, something to be grateful for. I, I find it very um, calming, nature. Beautiful. And I will tell you, I don't want to be a screen share hog. If someone has, like, if you have those pictures where you want to share them, or if somebody has uh, a moment they want to share as a moment of joy or gratitude, um, we can we can swap screen share. So please know this is an interactive group. This I don't own this screen. I'm here because you guys are enjoying it, but we can alter this as as we go. So okay, good. So wonderful uh, discussion, and thank you for adding to that, Polly. Um, so here's another piece. So okay, there's just me trying to come up with how does this work for me? What does it look like? And where might I start? Is it at breakfast? Is it before bed? Is it at that stoplight? Um, um, and then the next step would be, are there people that I can include in my gratitude practice? So I love that uh, as we look through this brochure, we're together. So we are just by nature of the fact that we're here going through this together, we're sharing this gratitude practice. And, um, and I will just take a moment to say how grateful I am to see all of your faces and to get all of your wonderful energy through this group um, and to know about this group and all of Ralph's good work to make sure this happens and even preserve it on, on video. Um, so how can we include people? There's a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, I'll share another example. I was by my parents with my husband um, and they gave us our Christmas card and we were sitting having a, a coffee with them. And the card had uh, the song, you know, Little Town of Bethlehem on it. And um, I don't know about you and your families. My family are not super musical. But they said, yeah, why don't you sing it? Because it had all the words to the song, right? The Christmas song. And so my husband leaned over and he started to sing it. And I was a little uneasy, like, wait a minute. This is out of the normal. Like, this is my family aren't people that break into song. Um, and then I was like, no, let's, this is nice. So we sang that song with my, with my parents in the room and it was a really joyous 
moment, but it was uncomfortable too. And I think that's the other piece that's important to appreciate is um, doing something that's novel. If it's not part of it, when it's a new practice, it might feel uncomfortable, but as long as you're okay with it, uh, I think embracing that going like, well, this is uncomfortable. And I think that's okay. And other times you might go maybe too much too soon. And I'm going to not do that. That's okay too. Remember there's, we all get an A, there's no wrong way to do it. And that means also knowing the pace and when it feels good and when it feels like too much. So, uh, so yes, engaging other people in that practice with you. Um, if there's someone who goes to bed with you at the same time, you know, seeing if there's something you do together where you tell each other what you're grateful for, um, that could be a wonderful way to, to do that. Um, if you're doing a gratitude practice and there's somebody who you have an ongoing relationship with that you engage in it, it can also enhance that relationship, right? Because you're bringing something positive and, and our relationships so often, right? Um, it's the work stuff. It's the hard parts of living that long-term relationships, that's, that's what we do together. And if that's all we do, it can start to degrade uh, why, we, why we found that relationship and hold it in the beginning. Um, and so introducing that gratitude practice with that person can help re-energize, I think, as well. Um, and then here's talking about creativity. Uh, so the, a song, a poem, uh, I, I don't know about you. Do you know any people? These are my favorite people. They'll just break out into a little sing song, right? They'll be like, I'm so happy today, you know, or something like that. And you're like, whoa, where did that come from, right? And then there's other people that would never do that. But knowing what works for you, if you have a creative spark, maybe it's taking pictures is another beautiful thing uh, to say, wow, I'm grateful for this beautiful scenery and I'm going to stop and, and frame a, a picture and manifest it that way. I love that example as well. So here's some things to consider. Um, this is a handout that um, you all have access to. And so would you like to start a gratitude practice? If so, what practice interests you most? What are the things that pop into your mind or, or start to make you think? And do you have other ideas that we didn't even touch on here for starting a gratitude practice? And then what would your goal be for your gratitude practice? What would it look like? Um, if you're like, oh, that would be kind of cool. It would look like this. Um, so you get some vision in your head of it because once we have, once we can see something, we can, we can get towards it um, easier. And then here's some more resources. This is so full of resources. Uh, the organization, including the VA, uh, the University of California at Berkeley, the Greater Good, and Robert Emmons. Here's the name of the res resources. So this one is articles on gratitude. This one is a book. And then here's more links. Again, these are freely available links. Here's a, uh, the one for the article on gratitude. And then here's all the references as well. So that is the gratitude practice. And then here's the other one I was trying to show you, um, which is just the overview of whole health, which we've talked about. And again, it focuses on all of your health care stemming from you and all of the buckets around you that are uniquely yours and are the things that are meaningful and important in your life. Because why be healthy? It's to do the things that we feel we're meant to do here, right? The people in our lives we love, the, the people we want to see, the things we want to be part of. And that's it. That's all my handouts. And I would love to, um, if people are comfortable, let me see if I know how to unshare or stop sharing. All right, I'll stop hogging that screen. Um, would, would anybody want to share uh, a thought or if you have something that you find helpful or you like to do or you might planning to do for gratitude practice or something that brings you joy? Polly, you, yeah, absolutely. I have, hang on, my joy jar. There's my joy jar. Mm. Oh, it's wonderful. And just a little Dollar Tree container and printed out a little label for it and leftover um, index cards from working with the school children. 
just to write something down on. There's one for us to talk about because Paul, you help school children, you help a lot of different people. Helping people is a good gratitude thing, I think. Good point. And then I do have, if I can share again, my photo from this morning. And I think everyone will agree that was when I was going into OT this morning. I, look, I looked for it on your uh, Facebook page earlier, but it wasn't there yet. We had a super pink morning like that the other day. Like the, everywhere I could see was just glowing pink. It was beautiful. Now, I'm really uh, lucky, Ralph. It's not there yet because I just got in. I, um, I know. had OT from 7.15 to 8.15. Then I actually can do the FES cycle, the electric stimulation. Yeah. I do that for an hour. So I did that from 8.15 to 9.15. Then the next 15 minutes, we're taking off all the electrodes and putting everything away. And then I stopped at Target to pick up an order on the way home. So I just got home, just got home and I'm actually in, usually I'm at my desk, but I am doing my dyna splinting right now. So my leg and my arm are all corralled right now. You're multitasking. Billy, you were yes. laughing, but there's quite a few electrodes involved in hooking up. Um, hooking you up to it it's kind of cool because it gives you like e-stem as you as you as you pedal at the exact right places i visited polly a little more than three years ago now and the, thing, time that ago. Yeah. the thing that impressed me was somebody was hooking you up and they got called away and the next person came over everybody there knows how to hook everything up and everybody at that at, 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 well you may be going to a different place now but a shelter i am road. At Sheltering Arms, the therapists there were unusually helpful just in my couple hours there, uh, my experience there. So it's, yeah, it's like you don't just jump off the bike because you have like literally 20 electrodes connected to you. Only 12. Oh, okay. It just seemed like 20. You know, Polly, pink sky means sailors take warning. Right. We, we actually had that discussion um, my OT's father is retired Navy, so he always said that. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Oh, Red yeah. sky at night, sailors delight. So, you're gonna so we actually did talk coming. about that this morning. Uh, I was going to look. Shovel. I was going to look and see if I had a a picture I took a number of years ago from uh, Amelia Island, but it's not on this computer. Red sky in the morning. It was the morning of a, a hurricane it was coming to Florida, and it was unbelievably red. Um, yeah. Um, well, I was standing in the um, pull-through, and there was a car coming, so I had to snap a quick picture and then try to get out of the way so I didn't get run over. <laughs> <laughs> and I am going to VCU now. Okay. Trying something, but they have the FES as well. Two, two things real quick, Julie. One, and they're both kind of big. Um, I, I find a lot of gratitude in being able to help other people. It, you know, the fact that um, I am didn't die, the fact that I got out of a wheelchair. There, there's a lot of reminders of what I have to be grateful for when I help other people because you can't help other people unless you're operating <laughs> from a strong base or at least a semi-strong base. So th that that's that's something that you know I'm I'm grateful for. I'm grateful that I'm in a position to be able to help and that you know I've learned a few things that that I can share. So um that's that's another one. Um, it's a wonderful example. Yes, to, to to be able to help people means you're resilient enough to do it, right? So wonderful. Yeah, I um 
actually in my in my late twenties, I I taught some disabled children to ski. So hopefully, I send a message to them that you can do whatever you want. It doesn't really matter what anybody tells you. Abraham, did you say you taught them to is it ski? Yeah. Oh, cool. I've been I've been skiing since fifth grade. So like skiing is simple. Skiing is skiing. You know, I yeah. If you grow up around it, yeah. 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 A lot of right. years in South Carolina. Mm. But well, there's no snow. I know. Very very little snow. Very little. Uh yeah. 2010 was the last time we got any real snow. Okay. <laughs> it was gone by noon. You would have had to get out of seven o'clock in the morning to ski in it. Um, I went out at seven o'clock in the morning to take pictures of it. And taking pictures- It must have been really thing. wet. What? 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 Was it really icy, like wet snow, kind of yeah. sleepy? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Was, yeah, was, was... I'd spent a little time out on, um, out on the West Coast. Well, I was out in Utah and the snow out there is like, um it's like styrofoam it's super dry and it doesn't pack up it, it's just it's wild or, well, i've yeah, never seen anything there's... like i grew up in new england like you we used to call that corn snow where it was like little teeny kernels no no it's not like you know like corn snow is like once it melts up a little bit like well on the on the ski slopes, they call it corn. Like once it melts up a little bit, it's like slush and it refreezes and you get all those little ice circles. But no, this stuff was like, it was like styrofoam. It just, it blew around it. It was gone by eight o'clock in the morning, really. I mean, you look at it funny, it would melt up, but it, it, there, it was, you know, cause we're in, I was in um, where this Southwestern, area of the United States and it's a big plateau and it's very dry so it would only go stand to reason that the um, snow is super dry and I don't know it's just weird I've never seen never seen snow like that well I don't know if it's just me but I think nature is healing for everybody when I'm out with my camera and I find beautiful stuff I feel very connected to something i'm not sure what but um i've got a real sense of um contentment um peace um connected although i don't know what i'm connected to grounded grounded yeah that's a good yeah. term and uh, you know i find that engaging in that like, you know, heading out with your camera and like looking for um, beauty is a good way to, um, you know, end up feeling grounded and, and um, at, at peace. One thing I thought I'd bring up, uh, I wrote it down like right away, but maybe now's the, the time to do it. And that, it's something that confuses me. And therefore, I think it confuses everybody because. I guess like everybody else in the world, if I feel like if I can't understand it, then other people maybe can't either. And that is um, the concept of self-care because, you know, some people have a concept that it's sitting around watching Oprah, eating bonbons or, you know, do, buying yourself stuff, treating yourself to something. Self-care is a lot bigger than that. I'd love to throw you another curveball here, Julie. And ask you to talk a little bit about the you know what what makes up self-care the various aspects of it because it's not just buying yourself a new shirt oh well you can me so i just want to start ralph by telling you how grateful i am that you're challenging me making my brain work a little extra hard on this day um so I, I actually have a manuscript that was just, it's, it's submitted, it's under review right now. And it's looking at a chronic disease self-management programs. And what, what do those contain? What are the elements? Again, this is complex stuff, right? So when somebody says, oh, self-care. And I, I always laugh because if you're in any kind of a, uh, an office or a, a group of people that meets regularly and gets, gets stuff done, so often they'll throw these terms around and they'll be like, yes, yes, self-care. Yes, we need to do more with this. 
and everyone sh shakes their head and agrees, and then off they go. And I, I say, okay, now the fun part would be take all of the whatever, five, 11 people that were in that room, interview them separately, ask them what they just agreed to. You're going to get 11 different answers. <laughs> they didn't come to any consensus. It's way too complex to just jump to saying like, are we going for it? It's like, no, no, you have to discuss what that means. And then how do you get at like which elements of it and how do you measure it? So um, yeah, like how do you how do you define self-care? Because it's different it? for everybody. But you were mentioning, Ralph, like some people it's like laying on the couch eating bonbons, watching Oprah. And that's a, that's very I don't know. I want to, I don't, I don't want to, you know, put anybody down, but I feel like that's kind of materialistic, kind of self-serving. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe not. That's, that's what, that's what the whole thing about it is. Yeah. It could, now, be, it could be different. For I everybody. love it. So, so let's take that example sitting on, and I, Oprah's my, my girl. So there's, I'm, she was in Chicago and we had her first, right? So I love my Oprah, but um, and sitting on the couch and eating bonbons and watching a show, that sounds like well, maybe that's not so healthy. However, let's look at the context. Let's personalize it, right, Abraham? So yeah, right. Um, what if it's somebody who's really type A and they exercise to the point of where they're it's actually unhealthy exactly. and they never take exactly. time to sit down, right? For that person, that might actually be wonderful self-care and really hard for them to get to. But if it's something uh, yeah. that's a routine that a person does um, to the exclusion of moving their body and being out in the world and, uh, and, and getting good nutrition and the right amount of calories and then all of that stuff, well, then it's not good self-care, right? It yeah. would be the opposite. Um, and so there, therein lies, to your point, Abraham, that's, it's complex and it, it really it is. is unique based on the individual. Um, I will say that there are um, some pretty good programs developed that look at wellness and look at self-care um, and they've been developed for chronic diseases um, starting really with arthritis because um, juvenile arthritis and arthritis are pretty broad um, and people can be otherwise healthy meaning they don't have other diagnoses so it's been the most studied and there's something called the chronic disease self-management program that really started this. And it was out of um, Stanford and uh, used a theoretical model that was started by uh, Banduras and uh, Kate Lorig met him at a party and it helped set her on her way to develop this, what I call a CDSMP or chronic disease self-management program. And that kind of fascinated me. So I, I started to study what that is. And it has different buckets, right? Again, another complex, thing to really try to wrap your arms around and different for different people, but it definitely has some common components. So we, we've got some anchors that we can access it through. One would be knowledge, right? So if there's something that is affecting your life, like a stroke that you had, right? Understanding what the stroke was, how it affected you and the things to look out for, for your symptom ongoing management would be an important part of your self-care. Um, another would be your coping strategies. Did I? Oh, it's just background noise. Okay. I didn't want to step on anyone's words. Um, so your stress and your styles of coping. Um, and in fact, they found that there are, there's the ability to teach people different coping skills um, and to measure uh, how, what type of coping skills am I using? Uh, we, we looked in that brochure we walked through together in gratitude practice and saw that there was um, using substances, right? Which again, if you're really stressed out and you have a glass of wine, um, that might be the, the, the thing that you do and it actually helps you relieve that stress. Um, but too much of that can be a bad thing, right? And if it interacts with medications, it can even be, a, not even that much can already be harmful to you or you don't feel so good or you don't get the benefits of your medication. So um, looking at the, the knowledge and the symptom management and then how much stress you have and the different ways that you can deal with that stress effectively um, in some ways being more effective and others maybe not so good in the long run, um, that's another area. Another area is your peer support, like having that network, right? 
I don't know about you guys, but when I've transitioned in my life, there's friends that you think you're going to be with your whole life, but then they're gone. Um, or there's just that separation where you're not as connected as you, you were, um, or people move away, um, whether that's psychologically or physically, like, you know, geologic location kind of thing. Um, so that peer support, making sure you have a network of people that you can talk to. So there's people to hear you and people for you to care about is another area of self-care. So those relationships. And it's funny because, you know what, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about how much this reflects in the whole health, all those bubbles, right? Um, they're, they're really well reflected in self-care. If you look at things that you can hone um, related to those, um, self-care and, and wellness are clearly they're interrelated very nicely. Um, so another would be your environment and that's both the emotional and the spirit and the physical environment. And that might be things like having an AFO that makes it easier to get around, or it might be putting in the grab bars or moving things in the house so that there's less trip hazards and things are more accessible. If reaching uh, takes a lot of your energy and later in the day, um, you don't have that energy, having somebody help rearrange so the things you need are in lower cabinets and things like that. That's also part of self-care, um, that you're planning to move stuff where it's more accessible and, and makes your life better to live it the way that you need to. Um, and I feel like I'm missing a couple. I know there's six buckets, environment, coping, knowledge, peer support, and two more. <laughs> that I can't think of off the top of my head, um, but they'll come to me. Oh, decision-making and resource utilization is another one. And then the last is problem solving. Uh, again, all of those are skills that um, when there's something that you know matters to you, um, honing those problem solving skills and there's, there's resources and people that can help develop those skills in an area. Um, if, if, if you needed to pursue that uh, beyond your own strategies, uh, like speech therapists and, and psychologists are very great in that area. Um, and that's it. So those are the buckets uh, for self-care that have been defined and researched for these programs. And I'll stop there. I didn't hear one for indulgence. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people confuse self-care with like, you know, some of the things we were talking about were indulgences, which actually, mm -hmm. I, I suppose they're, they have some place, but not, not a huge place. And they're not, they're, they're not the whole thing for sure. What you were describing okay. sounded more like our responsibility, you know, because after that was the whole um, healthcare aspect. So the, Self-care was the things that we can do um, that we, uh, on our own, where we don't need um, health care professionals to um, help us with it. I never thought about things like grab bars or moving things down, making things easier for yourself as self-care. I guess I was hung up in the whole indulgence thing. Too many buckets. Well, huh? <laughs> Too many buckets. Too many buckets. Too many buckets? Well, there's six buckets. There's not a seventh bucket for indulgence. But if you look, <laughs> a lot of people, you know, a lot of things that they mention as self-care are, you know, seem to me to be indulgences. I, mean, I think the main thing is patience. That's the main thing. Patience and always have a positive attitude. Two yeah. buckets. That's all you need. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a really good point. And so six buckets sounds like a lot, but here's another Chicagoism. So Bozo Circus, he had the six buckets, you know, and then you you pick and you throw that ball, you put your, your focus on the first bucket. And once you get that and you're like, I think, feel like I got this one down and I've got some patterns that this is, I'm, I'm getting good at it. Then you can enlarge that and if you want it and try to throw that ball in bucket number two, right? So it's nice because if it's a lifelong um, opportunity to explore this stuff um, and to have different things that can help us when we're struggling, when things aren't going easily, right? When there's a health uh, setback, when um, there's a financial setback, when, when life gets hard, uh, these are all 
I, I like to look at like, what are the levers that I can, I can help where I can take off the pressure, where I can have a, a, a positive way forward, where I can get out of the dark, you a know, slot machine. Yeah. So more buckets better, right? It's so there's a lot of different so, ways that we can look to get some relief and, and find a path forward. So one way, like, not now, control. but this one might be that. I'd be uh, image of the old plate spinner on Ed Sullivan would try to we were talking about filling up all this, all the buckets, you know, because you got to get back to that first one. Uh, you Joel, have to Joel is back there to, working the lever. Remember that guy he used to spin plates up on the top of dowels and get the whole table of them going and have to run down the the far end to get them going again. And anyway, I got the I, my. Crazy brain jumps up. Well, images of that. You don't want to see me spin plates. There would be a lot of crazy brains. <laughs> In terms Everybody's of self-care, gotta... Julie, I have a different situation. If I'm looking in the magazine, I really like the picture. My mind quickly turns around because I like quoting. How can I cut the picture into pieces and start sewing it all together with different materials? I don't know, it gives me self gratification. And I think that's so soothing to me. It's like, you know, I wanna start sewing the picture together again. And then it's like at night, I can really rest at ease. Like I think in my mind, you know, I can do this picture like down the line. It's like, I save the picture in my mind and I clip, clip it to my phone. So I can look at it again. So. I don't know if that that goes back to my mindfulness and my wellness together. Yes. And Winnie, I would add um, thinking about those buckets and there's a lot. So I, I there's not going to be a quiz on what are the buckets. Um, but one of them was problem solving. And it sounds like you have a passion and something that you're good at and it brings you joy, um, which is the sewing. And you see a picture and your mind starts to go, I can problem solve this. And you take steps and you even have a system of like saving it to the phone and thinking of it. And that gives you joy. Um, and problem solving is one of the, and resource utilization, which is another that you, you just illustrated in that example. Um, those are part of, of uh, self-care, of self-management. Um, so you're using, your, your example is using um, resource utilization and problem solving. And also, again, your unique talents, something that brings you joy, right? Which is what it's all about, all of our health. It should be stuff that matters and brings us joy. I mean, why are we put on this earth? I don't, I don't think it's just to suffer. I think suffering is part of life, but I think it's also to help emphasize the good stuff uh, by, by comparison, right? Of just how wonderful the moments can be of things that bring us joy by comparison. When, if you get some scissors and some glue and a big poster board, you can make a gratitude poster out of all those images that you want to, that you see in the magazine. Of course, you ruin the magazine and in the process. I remember making lots of collages in the late 60s and early 70s. It seemed like everybody cut out magazines and made collages, or maybe it was just me. Uh, I didn't. When I was in high school, like my Walkman, for instance, it was a one big collage. Like um, the inside of my locker at school was a was a collage. My um, I think the whatever cabinet I had to hold my stereo in my room was a collage back ask, then. Ask, yeah. your, ask your mom about collages. She's my age. Well, my my mom's a purebred hippie so <laughs> I, yeah. i'm sure i got that from her <laughs> mm -hmm. that's great she'll remember <laughs> collages anyway there's an idea when you'd end up with a big old gratitude board <laughs> at, at any time but the, you know it seems to me part of the thing would be the process you know because um so much in life, um, they make us look at the at the end game, you know, like at work and things like that. And life really should be about if you enjoy cutting things out and making uh, collages or if you enjoy taking pictures or if you enjoy helping other people or, you know, the, 
it's really about the process and the journey, not the destination. Now I sound like an IBM poster. But... Yeah, I know. And I'll, can I add to your poster? You have to smile at the little. <laughs> smile at the little things? Yeah, smile at the little things. And it makes the troubles little less. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're full of joy, it's hard to stuff anything else into you. Yeah. Well... Just so I, I wanted to add, um, uh, so two things. One, if people are um, wanting to do this, I wanted to suggest it might be nice while we're all here gathered together and, and talking about this theme to um, just to ourselves in our mind, if we just stop and do a breathing exercise and have that moment of gratitude of whatever that image or that thought is that we want to celebrate um, while we're here talking about it. If, does that sound like an okay thing to do? You got the floor. Yeah. You're the boss. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, no, it's a shared, this is a, a democracy. <laughs> so, okay. So um, if, if you all have something that you can think of uh, that you're grateful for, uh, or that brings you joy, Either one, there's no wrong thing to think about. Something that brings a smile to your face, something that brings joy to your heart. Um, we'll do some breathing, at, uh, just one nice breathe in and out. And again, it's box breathing. So we're gonna breathe in through our nose, like we're smelling our favorite smell in through our nose. We're not gonna do anything through our mouth because we'd miss that smell for four seconds. Then we're gonna hold that breath with this thought, this joyous thought in our mind for five seconds. Then we're gonna breathe out through pursed lips like we're blowing out our birthday candle only through our lips for eight seconds. And then we're gonna to try to hold that empty, emptied out breath for another four seconds. And then we'll take another breath in through our nose. Um, all of it while we hold that joyous thought. You, you ready? We'll do it together. Okay, ready? And I'll do the count for us. So in through our nose, one, two, three, four, breathe in, hold, two, three, four, five. Keep that beautiful thought, blow out through pursed lips, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and hold that breath out, two, three, four, five, and take a nice deep breath in. So what we just did is we combined breathing that we had fun with last time and anchored a grateful thought while we did that. And breathing can be hard. So if that threw you, you're not alone. <laughs> Did anyone find it hard? And you, you don't have to say this out loud, but you're, you're very welcome to share. Did you find it hard to hold a grateful thought in your mind? Were there other thoughts competing and trying to race in there, just distracting you? <laughs> I, I'm guilty of it all the time. It's not easy. And that's where pra the practice, that's like they say it's you're not doing it because you're an expert. No one is. We're always practicing. But the more we practice, right, the better we get at it. And we can control and bring those good thoughts in instead of letting the world that's always barraging us with um, negative stuff uh, and our own selves, we chase each ourselves with these um, thoughts, right? Why didn't Absolutely. I do this better? Why am I not faster? Why am I not this? Why, why, is, why am I at this stoplight? Why didn't I do this better? If we can close those down with that grateful thought, um, we get better at it by, by starting to introduce it and try it more often. I always feel like I have trouble hanging on to the thought while I'm doing the breathing because my mind That's wants right. to go towards doing the breathing right. I always think there's like a right way to do the breathing and there, there is. And also you scared me when you said we're going to breathe out for a count of eight and hold it for a count of five and everything because we do a breathing class and Angelia counts about three times slower than you do. So I'm going, wait a minute, I'm already having trouble doing six. I'm going to pass out. going to do eight. <laughs> I almost said, or just do what you can, but you count faster. And Nobody uh, passed out, so we're okay. Yeah. But I should have thought about that. You, there's no cheating in breathing. If if uh, breathing out for three is enough for you, then that's the right thing to do. Even if someone says to do five, um, your, their five might be your three. 
but yes, it's always what's comfortable for you. <laughs> well, we got one, two, three, four, at least five of us here. Done we have that. We, have that. Uh, we lost. I think we lost Abraham. Yeah, we, we lost did. Abraham. <laughs> Somehow, Are you saying he might have passed out because he he's took me at my word? He had to hold that breath. I hope. Well, my schedule is changing, so I may be able to come to Tuesday morning meetings now, but I'm still on the hook for Friday mornings. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, we're going to start one third Thursday. I think I'm going to pick the third Thursday. We're going to start doing... um once a month um, mental wellness for lack of a attitude, mental well-being, whatever. Somebody said, I, I, I used the word, am I okay? Or some, or when he came up with, am I okay? We ended up changing it to, I am okay, because people thought it was <laughs> negative. You know, if you ask for like 40 people, you, you know, their opinion, you get about 38 different opinions, which I did. Um, but we're going to actually start, um, once a month, um, kind of attitude, mental well-being thing. And somebody said, well, it kind of sounds like mental health. It has like a mental health overtone. I'm thinking, well, yeah, I mean, because we're kind of, we're not talking about like, you know, getting locked up, like in the nut house, mental health kind of thing, but, um, we're talking mental health, you know, I guess it gave her an, an, a whole negative, you know. Con conversation yeah. and um, I, I will say um, having worked with uh, rehabilitation teams and, and look helped bring in guidelines um, even physicians uh, pretty bright physicians and, and pretty good teams uh, there there is a range of people where when you say psychological or mental they just get really uncomfortable and and there, that's just buckets that make them go like wait a minute that if, if we're talking about this about me, this is something that I'm not comfortable with. And so even there's physicians that won't offer um, like psychology, psychology services because the family, they're, they're uncomfortable offering it to the family because their own discomfort with psych psychology being something that's important to all human beings for wellness. Um, but I'm not surprised to hear that, Ralph. Um, well, it, it, I think they start singing that old uh, uh, 60s song, They're Coming to Take Me Away, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a few people are old enough to remember that one. Oh, yeah. Um, I can't remember who did it. I was thinking it was a guy who was a deep voice. So I was thinking it was a guy who did the monster mash, but I don't think so. Anyway, not important. Uh, but obviously, that's what they're hearing. It's like, because it's like, oh, no, no. I mean, you, now you're talking like mental health. Well, yeah. You know, mental health is um, important. Julie, you, have, you, you may not have uh, heard, heard this before, but oh, yeah. we all, uh, most all of us get some form of physical therapy, but very few of us get any type of organized mental therapy. It's not something that's on the healthcare professionals radar screen to give us, you know, okay, you know, get him a shower chair, an AFO, uh, send him home and, uh, but. Pat him on his head. What? Pat him on his head. Pat him on his head. Good luck, buddy. Yeah. And uh, you're out of here. And, but, um, you know, that's it. Go to school of hard knocks. We'll hook you up with uh, physical therapy. They'll call you in about two, three weeks, whenever it suits them to call you. And, uh, but no mental therapy, you, you have to look for it on your own. And how do you do physical therapy if you're having mental issues? You know, I, I've not found that people that I've worked with who are struggling mentally really were able to focus that well on uh, <laughs> working on their physical well being. It's kind of a big old, you know, block. Yeah, well, I, I like to answer that question with, uh, I guess, a, a, a variation on that question. How can you have a stroke and need rehabilitation to go home and not need psychological adapting to 
chronic illness help to, to go through your recovery? How, how can you not? Um, uh, everything starts with our brain. We started as a zygote and our nervous system grew from that. And how we feel, we just talked about how gratitude and positive thoughts have physical manifestations in the chemicals that get released in our immune system, in our mood. Um, these are real measurable things now that we know. Um, and the healthcare system that we have was not built to address these things. So it's, it's broken, right? We have a broken system that is, it's, it's done a great job. It's done such a good job with what it was built for. It's created a need for something that it can't support. And so there, there really needs to be policy change and a paradigm change in healthcare. This, this is my humble opinion. It's what led me to leave my comfortable position, get my PhD and, and start to do research is, uh, and so, so another answer to your question, Ralph, uh, over the holiday weekend, I was playing through some of the, my data. I have a, the focus group data, which um, I still am looking for a few more caregivers. I have my, uh, I, I have uh, the last two people in my, uh, for my stroke survivors. But in playing a couple of the caregiver, one caregiver and one survivor uh, focus group and listening, uh, they were getting at just what you just stated. They got home, they had uh, binders with information, they had the physical uh, instruction on how to you know, help the person with the stroke with the mobility challenges. Now, like how do we get back in the house? Do you need the walker? Do you need to have adaptive equipment or, or look at things in the home? Do you need care while you make home modifications, but at no point was the caregiver who was helping that person get home uh, really focused on at all, uh, other than to do the stuff that they needed to do, the physical stuff, the giving them the medications. Um, and neither the person who had the stroke nor the caregiver were offered or given any emotional and psychological resilience interventions. Um, and I, I, I share my bias and in, in the focus groups, I share my bias too. Um, and this will be published this year, I promise. It's long overdue uh, and the data is gonna be finished being collected this quarter, but that's just not good enough anymore, right? It's just not, it doesn't work. It's, it's not getting people home to have a, a great life. And we're really good at getting people home now. And now we have to look at well, what are we getting them home to do? <laughs> and, and, and right. And what's really success. The mark of success was okay. We saved as much brain as possible, right? That's that whole time element of, of, of critical acute care and stroke early identification, educating the emergency system folks so they can recognize a stroke faster. There's even ambulances now that'll help do the CT to know if it's ischemic or hemorrhagic to get the um, TPA. If it's ischemic faster, which all saves brain cells, all of this, right? Um, we, we know that the, our health system has done amazing things to help people get home and, and live back at home. The problem now is if their life is just going back and forth to health appointments and, and that important part of wellness is not addressed at all, which means feeling good about like your, your new identity you have to adapt to. Right? The glass. <laughs> the glass yeah. is empty. It's gonna float away. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can say it better than what Ralph just illustrated. No, he's gonna float <laughs> away. <sighs> no, Billy, you have it right. You know, they say, um, okay, you arrived here, get in the car, you're going home, so slap you on the back, <laughs> pat you on the head, and say, Good luck. You know. There, there isn't any component. So, you know, I guess we kind of have a philosophy. If they don't give us what we need, we'll, we'll figure it out for, uh, for ourselves. So I guess that's kind of what the, the idea behind this group is. It's interesting because we had, a, I'd be interested, you know, privately, Julia, and your thoughts on it. Maybe I'll write down some thoughts and see which, and email them to you, see what you have to think, say about how I, how, not I, well, how I might do a better job with uh, um, 
directing the the group we we got together i thought everybody would want me to find like psychologists and i actually found a psychologist who had a stroke and that kind of thing but everybody was um pretty much interested in talking it out ourselves so that's the way we're gonna we're we're gonna um start uh approach it i have a feeling if this works that it's gonna end up being every week but I, I, I just want to say, I, I, I guess I can't resist. So we started this conversation talking about wellness and what is wellness mm -hmm. and, and sharing the veterans whole health brochure and, and this wonderful set of resources that they offer to the veterans um, that, that really I, I'm impressed with and I'm delighted to be able to share with you and, and you know anyone else who you think would benefit, I hope can see this stuff. But with that, you talk about bringing in healthcare professionals, you know, myself included. The fact that the group wants to lead is very self empowering, right? Like um, gathering the resources you want when you want them, but owning that it, it's your choice and you know what works for you. Um, I love that it fits perfectly with what is wellness. And it starts with that self efficacy and that self tailoring. Um, because you can always reach out and get me, get the, the psychologists when you want them. Uh, but as we come and go, sometimes what we're going to say is going to resonate and be like, wow, that was just what we, we couldn't figure that out. And we really needed to pull that person. And that's using your resources, right? But other times it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, healthcare, uh, I, I, the way I was raised, healthcare feels a little bit more paternalistic than I'm comfortable with. And, I, and I'm part of it, right? And I'm, one of, I'm, I'm part of the machine. Um, but I also really appreciate when, when we can have somebody who is a really knowledgeable survivor who's directing their care. And I think um, this group is a great example of having knowledgeable, supported, right? Because you've developed a network, uh, survivors who are gonna be better at directing their own care to direct me, direct the doctor, direct the psychologist of what you need when and explain to them why that is, you know? Um, so it's more of a partnership because um, they can't know, is, is they can be the best psychologists in the world they don't know you, they don't know your stroke, right? They, they can only know it as much as they can assess the buckets, right? Um, but what it means to you and what's gonna be the most helpful to you, only you can bring that forward. And that's where you're directing your healthcare team. I think when, when healthcare is at its best, I think that's, that's that sweet spot. Well. Just like we'd like healthcare to listen to us, I think that part of my job is to listen to everybody. Uh, do I get something out of all these things? Yeah, but am I doing it just for me? No, it's a, it, we're doing it to um, share knowledge. So, um, I, you know, I listen to the group, and uh, I'm, you know, if the uh, uh, and I figured like you were just saying, Julie, if uh, if at some point. Um, well, for example, if the um, stroke survivor who was the psychologist wrote back to me this afternoon and said, I, I, I want to come in, I, I'd subject everybody to it because I, I think that um, she would have a really unique opinion. As stroke survivors, we tend to have this um, idea, and I'm not saying it's wrong, it's actually quite uh, right in a lot of ways, and that is that it's hard for somebody else who hasn't experienced a stroke to understand where we're at and where we're coming from and 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 how we feel like you were saying julie you know you experience this life-changing event and they don't help you prepare for that on the mental side just the you know the physical recovery so we'll see you know it's like like uh, anything and everything, you know, we'll, we'll give it a try. We'll tweak it. We'll make it work one way or another. So. They don't have to walk the line. They don't know the details. Yeah. Sometimes you got to like, you know, you got to jump in. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you can walk around the pool putting your toe in the water forever, but at some point, you know, yeah, you go in. jump in. You can always adjust things. That's the way I look at stuff. Yeah, make sure the pool's heat. <laughs> make sure the pool's heated. Yeah. Well, I think about that because I used to, I had a pool in Florida and I used to walk around the pool and I would flick the water with my foot. Till my sales rep in one February and uh, said so she was back in Charlotte. I'm in Florida, and she said, "You know, the fact that I can hear the water and that you're driving me crazy, you know, because it's like freezing here." And you're so I, I never did it again. Anyway, <laughs> you, you know, you can test the waters forever, but at some point you got to jump in. So we're going to jump in this month, and we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll tweak it. You know. So I'm, I'm serious, Julie, maybe I'm sure that, you know, see, the other thing that I uh, feeling I have is that, like, um, we're constantly reinventing the wheel. So if there's been, you know, studies and research and information done on this type of stuff and you can point me to it, then, you know, I can read it and maybe make things better. So that's why I'd be interested in in what's that what's out there already what you know oh, why yes. should and, we reinvent the wheel and when these yeah. publications are are when they get published when they're accepted and and, and even in the pre-press i will be happy to share them with the, the group um cool well mm -hmm. you know I'll, I'll read them and and share them with the group if they're applicable or adjust you know our approach or suggest approaches uh to adjusting um Suggest adjustments to our approach to the group. There we go. We finally got it out there, Ralph. So, anyway, anybody else got any more um, questions for um, Julie? Sorry, Julie, I broke down. Just much rather call you Julie than Dr. Schwarzfeger. Julie works for me. Yeah, no, this okay. is about. Well, I usually Julie. refer to That's people by their titles, um, except when I'm talking to them personally, because you know, you know, it took you a number of years to get all that alphabet soup after your name. So, and I think that you know it <laughs> deserves some level of respect. <laughs> Anyway, if anybody's got anything else, it's like kind of like a wedding. Speak now or forever hold your peace. I don't think Julie sleeps. You don't think Julie <laughs> I, sleeps? I have a question. Okay. For sure. the study, would you prefer to be emailed? I, I know she had email and phone. Would you prefer email or phone? Oh, um, probably the easiest uh, if you're doing it now would be email. Um, cause I'm, I'm <clears throat> hopping on another, another meeting, but I, I, I could even call you back during the, like a, about a half hour from now, but yeah, if you're interested, you can email me and, uh, uh okay, great. If you call, I'll, I'll try to pick up too, but yeah, email right now is the best. And uh, sure. I think Winnie said she's in your study now. Is that no, correct? Not quite I yet. On anybody. Not quite yet. Oh, yeah. still waiting. But we'll, you know. Uh, I, I made a note to make sure to um, publicize that um, in the group. So we'll we'll get you some more. Um, um, yeah, I, I think um, probably January 9th, um, there'll be another group uh, that we'll be trying to get started at the same time because there's kind of that, that the training piece of like, what, what's this platform you use for the mindfulness study? So um, today or this week is a perfect time if you're interested to reach out and even if it's just to ask questions, there's no obligation just to ask more about it. Um, but well, it'll also, yeah. also be the perfect time because I'll edit this today and post it tomorrow and I can put, a, you know, a, a blurb uh, when I post it as well about, you know, you need some more folks. So call or email Julie. So. And I did your stroke camp the survey study in 2019. That's the manuscript that just went in for publication. It took a little while. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah, that um, I'm hoping to share that with this group once, uh, you know, well, fingers crossed, it's still going through review. It just, it just got submitted recently. So. All I got to say is Polly, you're everywhere. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> I am very connected. That's the truth. Yeah, you surprise. You continually surprise me. 
and the accent on the word continually because okay well here she goes again all right <laughs> so anyway um it's admirable you know i i'm uh I don't quite know how you do it, but you manage to be and stay connected to lots of different things, and it's a good thing. Um, so, unless anybody's got anything, this is a time where I'm going to thank Julie for um, giving question. up her time for us again today. And I'll tell everybody that in two weeks, she's going to come back and I've convinced her to talk a little bit about balance because. She's an expert in balance, and it's very important to everybody who had a stroke, isn't it? Maybe, maybe Winnie stop, said she had a question. Stop using the walls. Winnie's always got a question, right, as I'm getting ready to shut the meeting down. Go ahead, Winnie. It's, a, it's fine. I'm just teasing you because I can. <laughs> okay, Julie, um, the wheel that you presented, do you have to do one thing at a time, or can you do it any one of them? Ah, beautiful question. Yes. And, and the fact that it's a circle, which one is the first one even, right? Um, I will I will pull that up as I answer this question. Um, so here we are at the wheel. So you might say number one would always be your 12 o'clock on your clock, but someone else might pick a different one to be number one. The, the nice thing about it is, um, remember I was talking about levers. I had Abraham laughing when I was doing that. But these are just different buckets. And so depending on what is important to me right now, what's in my way, what are the things that are stressing or, or making that difficult for me, taxing me, one of these might be one I can easily access and think about and find something that's going to give me some relief. Um, and uh, other ones might not be as accessible. And so to answer that question, there's there's no linear, like you have to just do one at a time. And other people might, uh, like depending on the situation and on my own style of, of wellness and taking care of myself, I might find that doing a couple at the same time work really well. Um, and so, and that's okay. And this is all about tailoring it and keeping myself at the center and my mindful awareness of where I'm at, how I feel, what's important to me. But then also looking at these buckets in relation to what it is I'm thinking about and deciding which ones are readily available for me to make a change or to access in a way that is going to help me feel more well, more whole, um, feel better, take stress away. Um, so maybe it's getting out and going for a walk. Maybe it's uh, I love Ralph is just talking about how connected Polly is, right? So maybe it's that physical and emotional and creating that network and engaging with uh, things that bring me joy and people that understand me. Um, that's another bucket. Maybe I do both. Maybe I do uh, get with my network and I make sure I'm walking and moving and doing crafts and stuff where I'm moving my body with them, uh, which would be using two buckets at the same time. Uh, or maybe it's moving the body and also... Um, making sure I'm doing this with family and friends, right? Um, so it, it, you can bounce around that circle for any single one and you can vary it or combine those uh, as they make sense for your context. So again, there's no, there's no wrong way to do it. The fact that you're doing it and thinking about it at all, you get an A plus, right? It's, it's all about being able to go like, hey, wait a minute, how am I feeling? What can I be doing to feel better and to in, improve my wellness? Um, and any one of these, there's lots of rich resources on. So if one of these topics stands out, uh, none of them just say balance, um, but we'll, we've got that queued up for next time. Um, and chronic pain uh, treatment is another area that uh, I have a lot of material on that I can present, uh, as well as just neuroscience stuff, which is, I'm fascinated by the brain. Um, so if there's questions you guys have on that track, um, I'm always happy to talk about that stuff too. So should I write things down in each category? Say that again, Winnie. Should I write things down that I'm feeling in each category? Ah, so I'm getting to know you a little bit through your questions. And I know that you are a very good problem solver and you're good at just dedicating resources that work for you. Um, and so if, if it helps you to take a picture or put it in your phone, or put something where you've got a mental reminder on your calendar 
Uh, if those work for you, I think that's brilliant. Um, but if those don't work for you, you're not wrong not to use them, right? So that's that self-tailoring part. Okay. Does that help? Yes, thank yeah, you. Questions? Uh, Winnie, I, could, I believe I have this one along with a couple others and I have your email address, so I'll just email it to you. Okay, thanks. So, well, I guess with that, we'll thank you again um for coming i guess we'll see you in a couple of weeks and uh uh i got a lot out of it i hope everybody else did um the the point being i guess money would be to jump in don't look at the buckets to, okay. you know don't feel the water forever jump in the pool at some point you do it the way i would do it which would be i'd bounce around from every which way leaving one whenever and just going over here and then going back there and then heading over this way. But okay. eventually I'd try and fill them all up or I'd try and fill up all eight of them at the same time or one of those <laughs> crazy things that my brain does. So anyway, Julie, uh, thank you so much for um, coming and uh, we'll see you in a, in a couple of weeks. Yes, thank you for having me. So wonderful to see all of you. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye.